Hi, my name's Phil. I like talking about politics. And in this video, I'd like to discuss the prospect for differences between the various Conservative leadership candidates. Will it actually make a difference to us? And if so, you know, will that difference be better or worse than Boris Johnson? But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So if I were to say that it really makes no difference to us, which turd the Tories picked to replace their last King Turd, I've little doubt that a lot of people would readily agree. I don't think it even matters if those people are taking little interest in the leadership debate or are avidly watching every second. You look at the candidates avoiding any talk of the issues that matter to most people and realise that they've got no connection with the public. You look at even sane ones talking about support for the Rwanda scheme or the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. And you realise that even where their politics might be different, they're trapped into the support for the same things that Boris Johnson went along with. We can look at the candidates on offer. We can listen to their nonsense about an unworkable asylum policy, unworkable tax promises and a fanatical desire to really push the culture wars and conclude that, sure, whomever replaces Boris Johnson will be no better. But there are more compelling reasons than this. And I think the first thing to address, however, is the fact that Tories are tearing themselves apart over this contest. I've said it before. It's, it's, I am reading and watching a frankly harmful level of right-wing commentary on the leadership contenders right now. And it is vicious. These are the people most invested in the contest. And these are the people who may well be party members and therefore have a say on who the eventual winner is. What is quite clear is that they believe it makes a huge amount of difference who wins this contest. They will absolutely understand the damage they are doing to their own chances of winning the next by election, the next general election, sorry, by attacking candidates with a realistic chance of winning. Because they're attacking some of these candidates so savagely that if they ended up winning, they know they must be doing a great deal of damage to the party. It's not just the bad blood that it's creating, which will fester between now and that election, but members of the voting public are seeing it all. You know, you look at the media outlets on a daily basis attacking Penny Mordaunt, for example, because some of the media seem to be behind Sunak and there's other ones behind Truss. So they're all basically gunning for Penny Mordaunt. And I, I don't think she'll win, I have to say. Um, I may discuss that in the stream this evening. But she does have a very credible chance. I mean, she's the bookies' favourite. If she wins, how will the party move on from the fact they've salted the earth by slagging her off in their client media? Their own voters will think she isn't up to the job because they're being told on a daily basis that she isn't up to the job. And they know the risk in this but they're doing it anyway. So they must think it makes a huge difference who the leader is. And from their point of view, they may be right. The problem is, when you look at the issues that matter most to ordinary people, is there a real difference? Like none of them are gonna deliver the rebalancing of the economy that Johnson promised. He wasn't going to. Nobody was going to with a Tory government. None of them will address the real factors behind the cost of living crisis. None of them will seek to normalise relations with our allies and trading partners. I'm quite sure all of them would like to, but they simply won't be allowed. There's an extent to which it doesn't matter who leads the party because the party has no leader. It hasn't had a leader for years now. We're about to move on to our fourth prime minister in a row, who is basically just a front for the Tory cartel, controlled behind the scenes by others. The ERG have coordinated largely foreign special interests within the Conservative Party for a great many years now. This is why even candidates who know how damaging the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill are say they won't stop it. That's not to say there's no difference in this area. Rishi Sunak, for example, was known to have argued strenuously against dismantling the protocol not because of any regard for the people and businesses of Northern Ireland, but because of the consequences of a trade war for the rest of the country. So the fact that he takes that threat very seriously, when it's not at all clear that either Penny Mordaunt or Liz Truss do, is, I suppose, reason enough for sensible people to prefer Sunak. But that is not to say that I would cheer his election. The best reaction I think I would have to that outcome is realising that it could have been worse. 
but he'd still cut public spending. He'll still keep the economy badly damaged, as will all of them. Right now, I keep seeing uh, Tories are trying to say, oh, to stimulate growth and wealth, you need lower taxes. I, uh, this chart doesn't show growth. It shows GDP per capita against tax revenue as a share of GDP. But you can see a very clear positive correlation. And how on earth do you get growth without, G without productivity? This shows you that there's a positive correlation between taxation and productivity. If you ever want to debunk conservative tax theory in one chart, this is the one to use. Those with what you might call high levels of tax also have high levels of productivity. Not that it's the tax itself that generates the high productivity, it's what you do with those taxes. You look at the countries in the top right and you'll see countries with strong public services, good national infrastructure. This is how you get growth. You make sure businesses have got the infrastructure needed to succeed. But none of the leadership candidates are acquainted with reality. Or maybe they are and they just don't care. Maybe they actually do understand economics and they just spout this drivel to con the public, knowing full well that their policies only benefit these super rich. And when I say the super rich, let me be absolutely clear here. I'm not talking about people who are earning 50, 100,000 pounds a year. I'm not even talking about millionaires. I'm talking about people with hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds. They're the ones who benefit. We'll also see no return to more decent politics either. That's not a cynical judgment of the candidates. It's just pragmatism. If I were advising the Tories on political strategy, I would not advise them to start being honest. The truth dooms them. I'd just tell them to be smarter about their lies than Boris Johnson was. I would tell them to drop the culture wars because they're actually pissing people off, not winning them over, but their actual strategies don't seem to be telling them that, or if they are, they're not being listened to. So they'll keep those up. But the fact that whoever wins is going to need to be dishonest, even by the normal standards of politics, and distract us with ever more elaborate smoke and mirrors is also a worrying sign. There are people who think the government will lurch further to the right with the replacement. I don't disagree with them. Not because I think the eventual winner will be more right wing than Johnson, but because the far right of the party will have better control over them. Boris Johnson had a certain level of authority bestowed upon him by his electoral success. He could rightly claim to be the only one who can win them an election. If he knew how to use that power, he actually could have faced down the ERG. He had a lot of power there. He, the rest of his MPs would have been behind him. But he didn't, did he? The next leader, however, even if they have that resolve that Johnson lacked, will not be in that position of strength. Even if they wanted to resist the ERG, they're not in a position to do so. Nobody in the party is confident about the electoral prospects of any of these candidates. It's why they avoided Jettison and Johnson for so long. They just didn't see a successor. People would say, we need to get rid of him. And other people would say, with who? Who have we got? Liz Truss, have a laugh. Rishi Sunak, behave yourself. And they still don't have a successor. The pa I've seen a report already of a Tory MP apparently saying, Bloody hell, I wish we hadn't got rid of Boris Johnson now. You know, it, the, they don't have a successor. It's just that Johnson became so toxic they no longer had any choice. And this is both good and bad news. It's good news in that it means a decent chance of kicking them out at the next election. It's bad news in that the Tories will not let power go easily. They will become ever more extreme in their behaviour and rhetoric. The end result of this is not certain electoral collapse for the Tories. They are risking it. Unworkable populist ideas do win elections. They won in 2019. They've won in other countries, both past and present. And when they keep won winning, you end up with a fascist dictatorship because their policies are unworkable. They promise things they cannot deliver on. They can't deliver on these promises because it's all bollocks. So they have to distract their supporters with blame elsewhere. The enemy within or without or both. It doesn't matter. They have to make national enemies of others to excuse the lack of delivery. You know, vote us in and we'll have the power to do this thing. All right, great. So can we have this thing now? Yeah, so the problem is it's got this group of enemies we need to deal with first. You know, eventually they're expected to do something about these enemies, not just blame them. So then they do. 
it doesn't solve the problem. Because the problem was not these fantasy enemies, but the lies and unworkable policies of the populist government. So they have to become more and more extreme in their response until they tip the entire nation into the abyss. A lot of people associate the Nazis, which is the obvious example to use anywhere on the internet in any discussion ever, with the persecution of Jewish people. But it wasn't just Jewish people, was it? They needed a lot of enemies in order to fuel their path to power. A lot of vulnerable groups were persecuted. And although I don't think the Tories are Nazis in any seriously comparable way, you do see them adopting similar patterns, similar tactics. They make enemies of large groups of people, not just one. Whether it be asylum seekers or lawyers or judges, teachers, nurses, doctors, the media, even though that's largely under their control, remainers, even leavers who aren't quite brexit -y enough or not brexit -y in the right way. There's no end to the list of people they'll stick on the tally of enemies of the people. And this is the danger we're facing. I look at this path and I think there's a real chance to stop it at the next election. There's an island of opportunity to land safely. But that's what it is, an island of opportunity. If you miss it, you're in the scene completely knackered. And you look at this path and I think, I don't see any candidates as being leaders who won't tread it. I don't look at anyone and go, well, we'll probably be safe with them. I look at them all and I see whoever replaces Boris Johnson has been someone who is unlikely to win that next election. But they will want desperately to win that next election. And I think they'll all do it to secure power. And so although there are clearly differences with these candidates and there are some who would be preferable than others, in terms of what matters most, I'm not sure I see a major difference between them at all. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.